Hello and welcome to the Mind Body Soil podcast, a podcast where we explore the innate connection between the mind, the body and the soil. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Smart Soil. Smart Soil is an online education platform creating courses and providing resources from farmers for farmers. Join us as we share the stories and experiences from those dedicated to regenerating ecosystems, communities, and human beings. This week on the Mind Body Soil <coughs> podcast, we are joined by Jay Harmon, a biomimicry expert, inventor, and overall just incredible human being. I'm absolutely <laughs> thrilled to be here with Jay today. So thanks so much for joining us, mate. Well, you're most welcome. Thank you. After that introduction, goodness me. <laughs> now, <laughs> I think I'll put you on the payroll. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Hey, um, so I, I like to start with my guest, Jay, is um, to sort of set the set the scene a little bit, paint the paint the picture, <laughs> um, just a bit of an impactful moment that really set you onto the path of, of biomimicry or, or into the work that you do today. Well, yeah, um, I guess, you know, when I was eight years old, uh, I was shown a movie at school. I'm 73 now, right? So this is going way back. <laughs> movies had just been invented but i was shown a movie at school uh, of a nuclear explosion and uh, the priests at my school were talking about the chinese coming down and taking over the domino effect and australia was going to be taken over blah 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 so and for whatever reason they decided to show us eight-year-olds what an atomic bomb looked like and uh, it's incredible destruction and i thought this is the most horrible thing that certainly I'd ever seen and I could not imagine. So uh, I thought, whatever happens, I have to spend my life trying to stop that, right? So that was probably the most pivotal, pivotal moment in my life. And But putting that aside for a moment, I grew up beside the beach in Western Australia and uh, got to spend most of my time in the ocean. Uh, or around the ocean or on the ocean. And uh, I just absolutely fell in love with the marine environment. And I wasn't doing too well at school. So I spent my time daydreaming about fishing and swimming and designing canoes and things like that. So uh, I just got totally absorbed in that. I'd go to the back of the class, sit on my chair, kick back against the wall, and I'd zone out and I'd just be dreaming about the ocean. And uh, of course, my grades didn't do too well as a result. But, you know, my life in uh, nature actually did. You know, I got to be really fascinated by some of the operating systems in nature. And uh, it went from there. Yeah. So, and going from there, you obviously draw a lot of inspiration from nature from a very early age then. And um, that's bled through some of, all through your work um, being biomimicry. So could we zoom in a little bit on biomimicry and just right up front and give uh, listeners a definition of what that is and um, what you're using the discipline for? Sure. Well, biomimicry is really, uh, as another word is nature inspired. And if we think about it, nature's been around for a long time, right? So since the beginning of time and probably before it, but uh, uh so nature has had the opportunity through countless trillions of experiments over countless time to evolve the most efficient systems that we know of. In every single situation, nature designs more efficient, more elegant solutions than anything humans do, whether it's pumping water, you know, if we think of the, uh, the heart, what an incredible pump that is and how incredibly efficient it is that so can run nonstop for a hundred years. So um, using a tiny amount of energy, self-repairing, right? So, so nature everywhere does it such a much better job than us. And at the same time is completely sustainable. Nature's always creating the conditions conducive for life. And if we look at our built world, humans really don't have that set up well. We're creating the conditions that are destroying life and we're clearly not sustainable. You know, I, I, you know, people talk about sustainable technologies 
I don't think there's a technology on earth that humans have done, unless they're copying nature, that is sustainable. It can't be, as nature has worked out how to do it. And if we do it in a different way, we're not going to be smarter than nature. Nature would have already done that sometime in the last whatever uh, eons, right? So, and the thing is, if we're not sustainable, that means we're terminal, right? By its nature. And that's what we're heading headlong into. So biomimicry, uh, there's a wonderful history of it. Humans have been looking at nature and being inspired by nature since time began. So uh, if we look at our Aboriginal uh, people of Australia or the Aboriginals anywhere in the world, they're inspired by nature. And look at a boomerang, for instance. It's a, actually a, a remarkable aerodynamic piece of equipment. It's a wonderful tool. And aerodynamically, it's, as, it's more efficient than any wing that we've built in modern times. It's modeled on um, bird wings, right? And an incredibly effective tool. So, you know, we've, we've, people have been looking at how nature builds things and how nature moves things for millennia. But in the modern age, you can just go back, uh, you know, to the 40s uh, when uh, a fellow was hiking in the Alps and he got burrs in his socks. Now, this is becoming a well-known story now, but it wasn't just 15 years ago. These burrs on his socks and on his dog, he wanted to get rid of them. He looked at them under a microscope, copied it and created Velcro, right? Brilliant. So anyway, that's just an example. Now, uh, about 18 years ago, Janine Banyas wrote the book. She's a naturalist. She wrote a book called Biomimicry. And because she had spent her life in nature and had seen these amazing things that nature does over and over and thought, well, our whole world really needs to focus back on nature. We stopped doing it at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But now is the time, because we can't keep going the way we're going, generally speaking. So we need to get back to the master of all design, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, uh, said it over and over that if you don't copy nature, you're really wasting your time. You know, nature has the solutions for us. So biomimicry is studying nature. And some people walking through a field might stub their toe on something and say, oh, I never thought of that before. Nature's done that. Maybe we could use that. Or some industry's got an intractable problem and uh, starts to try and investigate has nature solved that problem? And my experience and that of my colleagues around the world would answer any problem that humans are facing, any problem, nature's already solved and solved hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of times in the most efficient, sustainable way. Um, and sustainable means sustainable. So it's no longer a problem, right? So, so that's biomimicry. Wow. So sustainability isn't just a buzzword then in, in nature's eyes. <laughs> like no, no, no. In nature, I mean, let's face it, the species come and go because things are constantly changing, but a, nature evolves to meet the circumstances. Mm. So in any given moment, the, what nature's designing in the shape of uh, flow forms or people or, or you know organisms is the ultimate expression of that organism for that moment and those circumstances. And circumstances might change, and then there has to be some evolution. Now, what humans have done is changed everything incredibly rapidly. Right when we've wiped out ninety percent of all of the trees on Earth in the last two hundred years. 300 years right that that's a dramatic shift and when we overload the atmosphere with co2 nature is evolving and will evolve and will survive life for us is not as pleasant as it could be in the future and for our animals and things nature will evolve but it can't evolve at the pace that we're changing things yes, yes. okay um just to to jump onto uh, Janine Benyus's book as well. Uh, 
she has a fantastic chapter in the, in the book about farming and perennial agriculture as well, doesn't she? And uh, I really mm-hmm. I encourage listeners to really um yeah go and have a look at that and and read that chapter because it was very inspiring and it featured a lot on the on the land institute and the the prairie and um how we should be you know pushing agriculture into more of a perennial system which I think a lot of regenerate regenerative agriculture enthusiasts um can resonate with so just thought I'll zoom in on that and also um while we're plugging books i think we should plug uh your fantastic book jay and uh, the shark's paintbrush um that was a another book i bought at the same time i think as i got janine's and i'll uh, tell you what it's bloody awesome there it is awesome. there it is <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah bloody fantastic um and it just features again uh, fantastic examples of how uh, humans have designed based upon nature's principles um which i'm hoping today we can sort of generate a few new ideas uh you know around farming as well and and how farmers can perhaps approach their farm systems um in a more natural and sustainable way so um that's very cool i think it'd be really awesome to zoom in on some of the work that you've done over the years too jay with um pack scientific and um if you want to just give a bit of a brief on that and and some of the inventions and and things you've come up with because it's it's pretty awesome stuff thanks uh david yes uh well as I say, I grew up beside the beach and spent all my time in the water that I could. And I was really interested from a very young age to try and catch fish. So I made a, a little spear out of a broomstick with a piece of sharpened wire on the end, and I went to try and catch fish. And I discovered, of course, that fish swam a lot better than I did, and so I didn't catch much for a long time. But what I noticed over and over were there were particular shapes in all marine organisms and the flow of water. And it was really reflected in seaweeds. As I was swimming along a reef, for instance, and a wave came and I was about to be washed up onto the rocks, I grabbed some seaweeds. Well, seaweeds are quite fragile and they'll break off in your hand, but in the most severe storms and huge waves, almost all these seaweeds survive just fine. So how can that be, right? That I noticed over time that they're all changing to a particular shape. Now, as you're just looking at it, same with leaves and trees and uh, even wheat in a wheat field. There's movement, but it looks chaotic. But if you really look into it, all those shapes are common. And it's the shape of the whirlpool in your bath plug when you pull, in your bath when you pull the plug. Now, they're whirlpools, right? Everything in nature moves in whirlpools, in the shape of whirlpools. Even if you don't necessarily see it straight away, when you start to look into it, all movement in our universe, our living environment or erosion or the atmosphere or galaxies or electricity, all movement is actually in the shape of spirals. And nature has never, we can't find an example since the beginning of time of nature ever doing anything that wasn't in spirals. It's never, ever moved in a straight line. Okay, well, what's the point? What's what's interesting about that? Well, our built environment, we have the idea that the shortest distance between two points, from one end of an oval to another end of an oval, if, if you want the shortest distance, it's a straight line, obviously. And if you want to use the least energy to get from one end of an oval to, to the other set of goalposts, you've got to run the straight line. If you run that football around the perimeter, you're going to be more tired than the guy that runs straight. So our whole built environment is based on that. Straight pipes, straight sided everything. You know, it's as straight side of a plane. Now, we use a heap of energy doing that. Nature uses spirals, which means it's traveling further, but it's using much less energy. How can that be? There's something peculiar about that. And that's one of the things that struck me at school when I was in physics class as a 12 year old. I'm being taught about this straight line, you know, the shortest distance thing, and I'm seeing all of this happening in in nature. Well, it turns out that a whirlpool is nature's mechanism for reducing energy because a whirlpool is virtually frictionless. If you think 
what do we use all the energy for that we create every year? You know, Australia's got all sorts of energy crises happening on the eastern seaboard now. You know, the price of energy is going through the roof. Everybody's freaked out. You know, Russia's activities have caused fuel shortages. You know, it's a real problem. And our fossil fuel industry, of course, is creating climate change. So energy, 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 that's the big problem that we have as a species. And it's basically also where we got all our wealth from. Right. So the whole modern world and the wealth that we experience, and we're vastly more wealthy than any human population in history. That's all because we've leveraged cheap energy. And now we're getting the 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 uh, the results of that. So where we've got this built environment based on straight line thinking that's using tons of energy. Nature uses these whirlpools, these spirals, because they're frictionless. Most of the energy that we use every year is to overcome friction and gravity, but mostly it's friction. Nature doesn't even bother about that. Friction is not a problem, more or less, right? So, okay. So what does this mean? Well, I spent quite a long time sort of thinking about that. And I thought, well, what if I was designing some boats and I thought, what if I... Um, could make a propeller based on these whirlpools rather than the way propellers are built today. And I thought, well, what if I froze a whirlpool? And, and I looked and there was no, nothing in literature of how you could actually do that mathematically. There's a number of reasons for that. So I actually froze a whirlpool. It took me quite a while to work it out. And there it is, the world's first frozen whirlpool. That's wow. it right there. I made a, uh, a fiberglass one first and then used that as a mold for this. Wow. So, yeah, so this is not a very big device. You know, you can see it beside my face. Okay, what does this mean? So I put this on a little motor to rotate it and I put it on a tripod and uh, I put it in a tank of water. And when I rotated it, it created a whirlpool because these sides here exactly match the streamlines of a whirlpool. So, and when, if you imagine, this has got friction, of course, because this is, you know, this is a solid thing. So it's a bit of friction when the water is going past it, but that entire whirlpool has no friction. And so I was able to put this, if you imagine, in a hundred million liter tank of water. Right, this is a pretty big tank of water, this size, and used 300 watts, rotated it at 1,200 revs, and was able to completely circulate that 100 million liters of water with this tiny thing. That, that now, size? From that, this one, yeah. Oh, so God. from an engineer's point of view, that's absolute nonsense. Clearly, I'm smoking the wrong stuff, right? <laughs> but so I went to some municipalities because, you know, our... If you go to the metropolitan areas or even country towns, there are big reservoirs, usually big metal reservoirs, that hold our drinking water. Well, of course, they get hot in the summertime. The, the water at the bottom is cold. Uh, but the water, as it gets up closer to the surface, is quite hot. And the disinfectant materials they're using to keep our water safe, chloramines, they're actually made from ammonia-based chemistry. And the residuals of that are fertilizers. They've got nitrogen in them. Right, so now you've got hot water with fertilizer in it. What happens, the water quality goes down and you get all sorts of problems, algal blooms and things. So, so now the municipalities have to go and tip more chemistry in there. And that's why in the summers, quite often you can smell it in the water when you turn the tap on. That's really expensive, and a lot of these uh, chemicals are considered carcinogenic. So if you could circulate that water, take the cold water to the top and circulate it, you can bring down the temperature of all of it, plus you get much better circulation of the chemistry, so you use much less chemistry. So we put this in 100 million litres, and we reduced the energy for a start to mix this water, because that's known practice if you could do it 
and they use pumps and things to try and do that not very effectively, <clears throat> we reduced the energy by 99%, and we reduced the amount of chemistry that was necessary by 89%. So major, major difference. So that's biomimicry, right? So, and once we had that, then I was able to do all sorts of variations on this to turn it into wind turbines, fans, cooling fans for houses, you know, fans, it, just air moving fans in all of their configurations use 22% of the world's electrical energy every year. Wow. Who knew, right? So 22%. We've created fans today that use the same energy as an LED light. So they're using up to 80% less energy than a typical fan, you know, a ceiling fan, your desk fan. Um, you know, all the server farms of the world um, are using an enormous amount of energy now and going up rapidly. Half the energy they use goes into running cooling fans. So it's totally parasitic loss, waste, wasted energy because these, uh, the chips are getting super hot. You have to cool them. They use fans. They use water jackets and they uh, evaporate millions of gallons of water off to the atmosphere, of drinking water, which is a waste of water to try and cool these things. And of course they're running all these fans. So we've shown over and over again and funded by US government agencies, we can reduce that energy load of the fans themselves by 50%. But we've also got a biomimetic refrigeration system because every whirlpool is actually a refrigerator. If you think of a tornado or a hurricane, what's nature's purpose in making that? It's trying to get, let's say it's a hurricane, it's trying to get hot water, the temperature of uh, the ocean, which is overheated. Nature is constantly trying to get homeostasis. It's trying to make things balanced. So it's taking that hot air that, you know, that, that's coming off that water and taking it to the upper atmosphere where it's cold, maybe minus 60 degrees, and it's trying to do it as quickly as possible to balance it. So that hurricane, that's all it is. It's a, a heat pump. So if you think about that, surely we can use that technology to refrigerate because our refrigeration systems using compressors, compressors are incredibly inefficient, about 22% efficiency. So that means nearly 80% of the energy is just going off as heat. So, and the whirlpool is totally efficient. So we've developed a uh, biomimetic refrigeration system to cool uh, server farms, chips. It uses, uh, it is 78% efficient compared to the current system, which is 22% efficient. Oh, yeah. So yeah, just all about whirlpools. Wow. That's mind boggling. <laughs> um, and yeah, so, and, so you've been at this for how many years, Jay? And since you froze that initial whirlpool and... and um... uh, I've been at it, I'd say, since I was 12. Okay. Yeah. Because, yeah, I made a canoe then uh, out of corrugated iron, you know, a secondhand sheet, um, you know, sort of stapled the ends together around a piece of wood each and uh, put some tar from the road and some canvas to uh, block, uh, you know, uh, leaks, and also where the nail holes were, put little patches on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, people did that quite a bit. They made uh, canoes out of corrugated iron. Well, having seen how fish swim and how the seaweeds are working, I thought, well, what if I got a hammer out and I started modifying this canoe and I beat, beat it into shape and it actually went a bit better. It was more stable and it seemed to... I mean, I didn't have empirical data on that, but maybe it was just my wishful thinking. But that, that's when I started. I was about 12. So, But then I joined the Fisheries and Wildlife Department when I was 18 uh, in Western Australia and spent 12 years uh, at that. I was a uh, skipper of patrol and research boats. So got to really sort of live in it um, and basically have done it ever since. So. Amazing. And are you seeing, 
are the tides turning in terms of um, big the big end of town? Um, these big companies are they starting to pay attention to these uh, these more efficient technologies, or are they, is it still quite hard to to get the get it through? There, there are three countries that have totally taken it uh, to heart. One is South Korea, and uh, I was invited there a handful of years ago to to um, I was the keynote speaker. I was the person um, to launch Korea. This is a government initiative, and they brought all the government ministers and heads of industry. They launched Korea into a biomimetic future. Wow. So it's, it's a full-on government policy. So that's fabulous, right? So China is doing it as well. And I was told five or six years ago, China had more than 400 research institutions in the country that were focusing on biomimicry. India has dozens and dozens of universities teaching biomimicry and doing research. The Western world, not so much. Um, Australia, uh, I'm not seeing, I'm really not seeing uptake. Um, I'm not seeing much interest at their research institutions, even when I approach them. I, I find there's very little interest, um, you know, and it's really extraordinary because we have such resources here, with such a need to use wind turbines, for instance. We're going solar, we're going wind. We can improve those wind turbines significantly through biomimicry. Can't get anybody interested in Australia. The uh, just even using this to uh, to improve our water quality can't get any interest in australia and yet this is the most specified technology in north america now for municipal water supply right so this is in several thousand installations we can't get one into australia not not interested so kind of amazing you know and hydrogen australia leads the world in hydrogen initiatives and hydrogen really is the fuel of the future. It's a wonderful um, alternative to fossil fuels. And it solves a lot of problems that wind and solar can't do. And so those niches where you can't use solar and wind. Um, so Australia's got uh, something like 60% of the world's initiatives, even though we're only 1% of the world's population or thereabouts. West Australia has 40% of Australia's initiative. So there's more happening in WA uh, than anywhere else in the world, right? And I've reached out to dozens of folks in, a, in Australia because we have, and the American government has funded us to improve the way you do hydrogen, including we won President Biden's uh, energy prize for reducing the cost of hydrogen. And while we produce hydrogen, for every um, litre of water that we produce to make hydrogen from, we can produce nine litres of bonus water that's absolutely pure for drinking water. So for Australia, it's an extraordinarily effective, important thing um, and no interest. It's just remarkable. So, we're, yeah, so really, so we're doing it in America and other places. But uh, yeah, the short answer to your question, um, the uh, Asia, absolutely. And of course, China, China is very focused on uh, sustainability in the future, even though it's still building coal-fired um, power stations, it's, it's got its eye on the future and sustainability in a very big way. So. Absolutely. Fascinating. Um, I'd like to just weave a couple of threads back to farming here. And, and as a lot of our listeners are farmers or, or land um, carers so what what can farmers really take away from or learn from biomimicry i mean they are probably witnessing and using the powers of observation every day um, out in the field and seeing things um, so where do you think the the major sort of wins for farmers are in, in biomimicry right well you know there's a heap of them really everything from uh and look, the first thing I'll say is I, I am not a professional farmer and farmers, you know, all the farmers I know have 
this is their life. You know, they've lived it since they were kids and it's in them and they're in it, right? So I don't pretend to do that. So I have a farm, but, you know, it's a, it's a small one and, it's a, and I'm mainly, mainly growing trees. But, um, but certainly in technology, um, first of all, nature doesn't do monocrops. So monocrops, by their nature, uh, have challenges, and I don't need to tell you or farmers that. So one of the great things to do there, of course, is to address that. How can and, and a lot of our farming needs monocrops, you know, whether doing wheat or barley or whatever. But how can we introduce other things to um, to get closer to how nature does it? Yeah. You know, you know, manages a forest, for instance, or a prairie, right? So even our prairies in the world, our savannas are not monocrops. So are there ways to to um, get benefit from those kind of studies? But um, but apart from that, um, regenerative uh, agriculture, of course, speaks for itself, and I, I won't go there. But uh, technology, um, uh, methane capture in dairies. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, things. So um, I can supply you with all sorts of uh, books and references and literature and uh, biomimicry.org online has heaps of information that I could uh, direct you to. So. Fantastic. And uh, one thing I, I, I think we will go into a bit later on or, or we can go in there now, but the um, power of, of fungi and mycelium and, um, you've recently been featured on the uh, Fantastic Fungi film with Paul Stamets, and I was reading your chapter again uh, last night in the in the book. Um, just got it over there, and you said something. There was a, a statistic in there that was quite striking, um, and it said that well, we've there's ninety nine point nine nine percent of all species we've actually made extinct. Um, so I think it it comes back to what you were just saying about the regenerative agriculture it if we are to have a sustainable agriculture we actually have to regenerate because of those species uh, that species loss is is immense you know um so i i think it'll be really cool to just uh dive in a little bit into mycelium and, and fungi and and how important uh you think it is and um also the fact that you said that uh there's something uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It was like a hundred thousand species or so of, of fungi, but they think there may be millions, um, right? Undiscovered yeah. or or still yet to be discovered. So, um, yeah. What are some of the learnings that, that you found um, when going on that journey? Well, um, Paul Stamets, of course, is the man, and uh, and I think I've mentioned to you before. Uh, I could probably get him to do a podcast for you. Nice. Uh, if you'd like to pursue that, he he really is uh, the guru of everything to do with mycelium. But Absolutely. Um, yeah, but nothing is healthy in our forests or in agriculture without robust mycelium activity, right? So, and and yeah, so um, the the. The, the things that I've been most focused on with mycelium is not to do with agriculture, but with uh, waste management. And uh, and Paul, of course, has written numerous books, and he's done. Uh, he's got endless patents um, on how to uh, apply mycelium for all sorts of things, for farming and for health, etc. But uh, the things that I'm most interested in are how do you uh, decompose waste sites? You know, like super sites in America, for instance, are incredibly polluted areas where factories have been for 100 years or whatever. There could be arsenic there or cadmium or lead or whatever. And typically the super, and, and under petrol stations, when a petrol station is, uh, is moved on uh, for redevelopment or whatever of the site, um, Often these things become super sites. And that means that uh, waste management companies come in and 
even just 10 years ago, it was over a million dollars per acre, like uh, two and a half million dollars a hectare just to remove that soil, take it somewhere else and bury it, right? So now you've just changed that super site to another super site, but now that one can be refilled and used for something else, right? Yeah. And uh, and some of those uh, management uh, operations are organized by some fairly shifty characters, right? So I won't go into that, but um, there, there's been some amazing work done in, in America on uh, cleaning up these sites with mycelium. And it's quite staggering because, uh, and with certain plants as well. And of course, plants don't thrive without mycelium. But the uh, mycelium, uh, the things that break down toxins, they break down biomass so, and make it available for new growth, etc. cetera. Uh, but there are mycelium that can remove cadmium and they can remove all sorts of the worst toxins. You can E. coli, all sorts of things, even petrol. There's mycelium and bacteria that break down petrol and diesel oil that are in the soil and can completely clean it up. So it smells sweet. It can actually be used uh, as a compost. Wow. So. Amazing stuff. And you, the way that you speak about them in that film um, is really beautiful, I think, be as as beings, you know, like the these creatures um, that we still know so little about, uh, you know, everywhere and so um, far-reaching in their capacities to, to heal and regenerate. Um, really well, it's, yes, it, it's the most common life form on Earth. It uh, has uh, more than 90% of our DNA as humans. So they're closer to us than plants by a big margin. Yeah. And... Uh, and no life would exist on earth without mycelium. Mm. And yet there's hardly, comparatively, hardly any work being done on the bigger picture of mycelium. There's a lot of, uh, okay, here's a particular variety of toadstool, so people concentrate on that. But the, the research that's happening on the worldwide web of mycelium is very small. Paul Stamets is one of the, the main folks, of course, and there are some folks doing it now. But there are huge discoveries to be made. Where they say that, for instance, the oceans, we know less about the bottom of the oceans, the deep oceans, than we do about space. Well, we know much less about mycelium than the deep oceans. And uh, th so this is remarkable treasure trove of information. And talk about biomimicry. What's going on under the surface of the earth that we can learn from that we have no idea about? And one example, for instance, is the uh, Japanese subway systems. They wanted to optimize them. So what they did is they created the same uh, model of the features of the landscape under Tokyo. And uh, they put mycelium to work. And mycelium actually made pathways through this landscape that turned out to be the ultimate pathways you could put a subway system. So that's biomimicry, right? Yes. So yes. there is so much to learn. So cool. And a lot of it is just being humble and, and you know, uh, accepting exactly. we, that yeah. we don't know, you know, what we don't e know. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, so just even in a forest, you know, the trees all sounds peculiar, but it's been proven well and truly now. But for people who have never heard this before, it sounds like a bit woo-woo. But tree, mycelium, actually help trees help each other. You might have a healthy tree in the forest and an unhealthy tree, and that mycelium will, the healthy tree will contribute nutrients and, and uh, uh, remedies to the unhealthy tree via mycelium. And in a forest, this is going on all the time. All the trees are connected to each other, and they're all talking to each other under the surface as i say that sounds woo woo but the data's there it's really if anybody's interested have a look at it it's extraordinary absolutely it's so fascinating and um paul samitz is actually the man that uh got me into this you know soil and uh regeneration and all that many years ago as i believe a lot of other people have been inspired by his ted talk um 
that was just like, what, what do you mean? They're, they're everywhere and they jump out after you walk through the forest and uh, it's just so cool. Um, very, very awesome. So Jay, you're 74, did you say? And, um, yeah, yeah, shortly. shortly. Yeah, getting okay. there. We, won't, we won't jump yeah. the gun then. Um, <laughs> but, you know, how do you, I just want to, because in this, in this podcast, we like to explore some um, different methods and, you know, um, whether it's spiritual practices or, or physical practices that just help to keep people motivated and passionate and happy um, while they're out there doing their work. Um, so I'm just interested to explore some of the, maybe there's some, um, you know, health, health uh, patterns or things that you have followed over your life that have maybe contributed to your vigor and, and happiness and, and passion that you still um, are, are displaying at your age. Well, uh, big subject. Now, uh, what I, what I, my take on life, and I've seen it this way since I was a kid, is that everything that we do is a spiritual exercise. Now, if you think about it, there's not a person on earth that truly knows where we came from, why we're here, and where we're going. There's lots of beliefs. There's all sorts of religions and anti-religions. I mean, there's all sorts of things. And often they're in conflict with each other. They can't all be right, right? So, but the believers believe they are, but something's missing in that story. But putting religious, uh, religions aside, we're in this little blink of an eye, this lifetime we have, Blink of an eye, even the life of this earth, blink of an eye in this whole cosmic thing. So we're, our little life is bookended by what? Right. And why is it that pretty much all humans since time began from even, the, and certainly our indigenous peoples, fundamentally know that there is something bigger than us. Right. And... And all religions started with shamanic practice with indigenous folks and religion sort of came out of that for better or worse. So if everything is a spiritual practice and, uh, you know, somebody asked me uh, years ago if I believed in God. Well, the only thing I could say to that <clears throat> is there is only God. Right? That concept that everything is included in one right and most of the religions of the world even say that right that we are one or, you know buddhism is uh, you know become one right so nothing is outside that one because if you imagine if something's outside of it it's not part of it so you can't actually see it. you know it's like a metaphor that's been used the fish in the sea doesn't see the sea, right? Yeah, but it's yeah. part of it, right? So, so anyway, uh, putting that aside, I, you know, I, I, I've made a, I've found all of this incredibly interesting my entire life. I was raised by Jesuits, so I didn't really like how I was raised, but it did give me uh, a sense of inquiry. So I really put a lot of attention into the meaning of life, if you like. And uh, and studying with different teachers around the world and practices and um, and for me it's all about nature, right? So the one thing that we do know, whether you believe in a god or whatever you want to believe in, the 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 one evidence we've got of something is nature. That that tells us everything that we can possibly find out. It's in nature. So so to me, when I'm in nature. The other thing about nature, when you're in nature, there's nowhere to fall. You're totally home, right? Nothing can truly hurt the inner me in nature. Now, a snake might bite me and, you know, hurt my body, but this, this thing that resides in my body, nothing in nature hurts, right? The, the world of people can, it feels like sometimes, but, but nature, there's nowhere to fall. So, uh, and, and I think a, a really big problem with the, the earth today is, and it's pretty obvious, of course, and people talk about it, is that 
quite a bit, quite a few more than half the world's people live in cities, not in nature. And you see these, you see any sort of aerial view of a city now, there are hardly any trees there, you know, that people don't get to parks. So how, how can we be healthy emotionally and spiritually if we are completely devoid of access to nature? And it's really interesting, just one little thing on that. Um, a particularly violent prison in America, they're having all sorts of problems with their, with, you know, high security prison. Some folks went in and painted a mural on one of the prison exercise yard walls and they painted a forest. That's all they did and violence in the prison went down by half. Right? So, so there's something, there is so much evidence to say that nature is, um, is what nourishes us as beings. Yeah. So. That's beautiful. That's a, a beautiful wrap, way to wrap that um, the spiritual piece up, I think. And the fact that nature is, you know, it, we are nature. And I, I think people, um, it can be hard sometimes because you can feel separate from nature in, in some sense. But if you can come back to that, that we are a part of nature. And um, I love how you've gone into in, in your book about um, all the spirals and the whirlpools and the geometry of, of like you say, our heart, the cochlea of our ear and, and some of those things um, are just designed upon these, these principles of nature. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful design. I don't know if you want to. And I just, I just want to add to that, uh, yeah. you know, if you, you know, these spirals, right. The, the equiangular spirals, but these spirals that we see in, this is the archetypal shape, right? We see it in a nautilus shell. Yeah. Now we all we've all seen nautilus shell, and it, it's a remarkable thing. You look at that, and it's kind of gobsmacking in a way. It's a it's something curious about it. What what's going on there? That this thing that almost looks like somebody designed it, that somebody pretty clever designed it, right? Yeah. And uh, so, what's in that? Well, you know, since people first thought a thought in this world, they've been fascinated by these shapes, you know, by spirals, whether it's uh, uh, tornadoes or willy willies or uh, curls of hair or horns or great tendrils. And so it's people have associated these spirals with their idea of creation, fertility, intelligence, God, you know, the result of it is that these spirals are the most common icon through all of the world's religions, pre-religion, animism, shamanism, um, right through to the formal religions of today, even a bishop, bishop's crook, right? You'll see um, these patterns in the, uh, the way that the, all the Celtic art and the way that Middle East, uh, Middle Aged uh, people inscribe Bibles. These spirals are everywhere, right? So, um, so it uh, represents the mystery, if you like. And uh, and for me, that I, I found that particularly interesting, and uh, I've actually been writing about it uh, over the years. And that might be my next book. In fact, is uh, is spirituality um, seen through the eyes of humans from prehistory and how it is a biomimic thing in itself. Yeah, and that that uh, Nautilus shell that you held up, I mean, if you were to do the mathematics on, on that spiral as well, I mean, it is, uh, the math speaks uh, perfect as well, doesn't it, in terms of the... Uh, um, you'd know more about this than me, but I've, I've got a fascinating book. I think it's called The Power of Limits. Um, right. It, yeah. It, wonderful book. Yeah. It talked mm -hmm. about, yeah, that the mathematics behind those spirals as well and how they're proportionately, um, you know, perfect. It's unbelievable. Yes. And this, uh, if you keep the spiral going, um, the math of this goes to infinity in size going up and also going down in size. Um, the, uh, the ratio of it, um, it, it's an irrational number, but 
Uh, I'll just explain a couple of things without getting into technical stuff. But if you take a, a line, a radius through there, and let's say the spiral keeps going, everywhere that the line cuts one of these, the angle is identical, wow. right? That's why it's called an equiangular spiral. So it's not like a, an equi equiangular spiral, like an Archimedean spiral or a clock spring, because uh, the angle changes every, every time it cuts, right? This is equiangular. But where it gets even more interesting, if you draw that line from the center out, and then you measure where it cuts each of these, so that distance compared to that distance mm -hmm. compared to the next distance is called divine or sacred geometry. And that's what all the religions of the world got really interested in way back, right? So that ratio, the golden ratio, the sacred geometry, the divine proportion, that ratio of how it expands is in your finger. That bone compared to that bone, compared to that bone, compared to that bone is exactly the same as that. Wow. Right? Now, that ratio is in every living thing. And it's in all movement in our universe because every living thing goes through a liquid phase in its development. So it takes on the geometry of whirlpools. So we see it in the human body, for instance. Um, if you look at, I've got photos, and they're in the book, of fossilized trees that are cut through, and you can see where the fossilized sap veins are, and they're all whirlpools. Sap goes up a tree or a, 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 a stalk of wheat or anything else. Every plant, the sap is going up in a whirlpool shape. Our human heart, the muscles are in a whirlpool shape, and blood flows through our system, 100,000 kilometers of veins are all in the shape of whirlpools and our blood goes in a whirlpool. And when we breathe in and out, it's in whirlpool shape, trachea. And our noses are spirals. And in fact, uh, if you look at a dog's nose, you see two spirals. And those spirals accelerate the air. That's uh, the other thing a whirlpool does, it's an accelerator, right? So it accelerates the air. So when a dog is sniffing something, he's actually sniffing uh, with this incredibly efficient pair of whirlpools. And so it concentrates the scent. And a camel who can't afford to lose moisture in the desert has whirlpools in his nostrils that accelerate the air. And when you accelerate air, the pressure drops. When the pressure drops, the temperature drops. So when the pressure and the temperature drop, all the moisture in that outbreath get retrieved. So his outbreath is drier than the desert. Wow. So uh, yeah. So anyway, that's all in these proportions because every whirlpool is built to the same proportions as this seashell or as your finger. Yeah. And our bones. Yeah, everything is. <laughs> wow. This is um. I knew my mind was going to get blown today, Jay, but it's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so cool. Um, a couple of a couple of things just to to finish up, Jay. Um, and I'm so grateful uh, for your time as well. I know know you're a busy man. Um, but we like to explore this as a a, a bit of a theme that we run through. Um, it's more of a, I guess, a hypothesis that we're working from. Um. But it basically, it explores that if a farmer is healthy and happy, then it is reflected upon to the landscape um, and the landscape will be happier and healthy. Um, I'm just wondering if you, if in saying that, if that brings anything to mind. Um, and it, yeah, I, it's about love, isn't it, really? <laughs> if you, if, you know, from a farmer's point of view, if you love what you're doing, if you love your animals, if you love, if you love you that whole existence that absolutely is going to reflect on the landscape because if you're in love with your animals, you want your animals to be happy. So you want them to have shelter. I mean, unfortunately, I, when I'm driving in the country and I see lots and lots of animals with no shelter at all, I, I really feel bad for those animals. 
and they do better if there's a bit of shelter. Uh, you don't have to go to a lot of trouble, but a few trees in the right position. And, and that's why if you have trees, the animals all go there when it's too hot or it's too bleak. Yes. You know, like we would. You know, none of us, no animals want to be out in the prairie if you can avoid it. So, um, so yes, I think that absolutely, if uh, if the farmer is healthy and particularly loving what he does, and it, that can be extremely challenging if you've got severe droughts or fires and you've had a really bad season. Well, then you know it's not. Uh, uh, unexpected that there'd be a certain amount of depression, right? So then it's really hard to to be happy. But the landscape is is really dominating us at that point, right? So yeah. that that's a tough one. So it is, and I think it's something that probably speaks to the situation that we're in um, in that larger scale. Is that the landscape, like you mentioned, has had ninety percent of the trees cleared. Um, in the last couple of hundred years, you know, it, and we actually get feedback from those trees, whether it be near infrared yeah. light that makes us feel happy. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Therefore, maybe the land can be our savior in that sense too and, and make us feel great. Um, yeah. so that's, that's really cool. Um, another thing is just on how to stay more focused as a farmer as well, or um, on, on, I guess, the problems that we have at hand or some of the tools that they might. If you're a farmer, say, and you wanted to employ something like a base level of biomimicry onto your land or to solve some of your problems, where would you start and um, how would you go about it? Just diving into the subject. Or... Um, well, for me, is uh, waste management's a good one. Mm. You know, biomimicry is really good at uh, waste management, whether it's, uh, you know, um, um, byproducts from cattle, um, you know, and I know a lot of farmers are using that now. We're using, you know, we're much better at it than we used to be. Uh, but any kind of waste management that includes equipment and fuels and uh, filters and all this sort of stuff. I bought a farm that's one of the earliest farms in the region, so it's been used for a hundred years, and uh, I've already found thirteen rubbish dumps on the farm. It's only 100 acres, right? 13 rubbish dumps. And and some of them are fairly recent. Some of them go back a long way. But the And I've got uh, 15 acres of pristine forest on the property. And that became one of the rubbish dumps, just stuff thrown into it, right? And there are people that do that. Most farmers don't, but there are people that do. And uh, I mean, that's, first of all, it, it's inexcusable. But secondly, um, all of that waste can be uh, useful for other purposes, all waste. You know, from nature's point of view, there's no such thing as waste. There's not one thing in nature that's not a resource for the next thing. Nothing, right? So when we follow that model, everything's healthier, tidier, cleaner. You know, I'm old enough that I remember not that long ago, but maybe 40 years ago, you drive a, down a country uh, highway and there was rubbish from one end of the highway to the next. Cans and bottle, broken bottles and, you know, everything just thrown out the window and cigarette butts everywhere. That was normal, right? Now that's very rare, thank goodness. That's fantastic. And there still are some places, but but mostly we've, we've actually gone past that and uh, we're getting better and better as a society at recycling. Yes. But I think treat everything as recyclable, doesn't matter what it is. And, and because of that, there's probably some, even some wealth in that in as much as by bringing your attention to recycling, we, uh, we're wasting less of our resources, our money, our own money. And maybe there's a way to have that pay us uh, in some way or we're not paying to get rid of it so that that's a big one for me so totally. no, that's a fascinating insight. and trees and trees i mean i remember when trees were bulldozed and into a huge windrows and burnt you know whole forests well we're still very neglectful of trees you know we're still burning much more than and, and now you can't even cut firewood, right? So firewood is uh, becoming a very scarce, very expensive resource. So 
there are ways to use that. Now, it's convenient to just push it up and burn it, but a little bit of thought and, and a lot of that material doesn't have to be burned. Yes. Yeah. That way. A hundred percent. Yeah. And that's right. And I um, love the work that you do with Timber and um, you've really lit my fire, uh, I say, to, to planting trees and, and um, that longer term vision for, you know, tree planting and, you know, having timber for, for my children and um, and all the others. So uh, thank you, Jay. And um, just one last question and, and um, I'm going to let you go. Um, what are you focusing on next, Jay? You mentioned a book perhaps, but um, what's what's on the cards for you, mate? Well, uh, the book for sure. Uh, I, But I'm also uh, really interested about like, I mean, I'm interested in heaps of things, you know. <laughs> the, 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 we're not here for a long time. It's just a good time, right? We're, there's so much to do in this earth. It's just, it's fascinating. So much to do. Um, but I tell you what I'm really interested, well, first of all, I'm planting a lot of trees. And that's planting forward because at my age, I'm not going to see them as adult trees. But, but I'm getting the benefit from trees that people planted 50 years ago or 100 years ago, right? So... So, and I get a lot of satisfaction. Uh, it's just wonderful to see trees coming. But what I'm really, really interested in, have been for a long time, and I think I may have the answer, is if you look at the atmosphere where we get rain from, right? People are trying to seed clouds to get rain. Uh, that's very limited effectiveness. But when countries get really desperate, they try it again. It's very expensive. China's doing it right now in some of their drought areas. Um, very, very expensive, not very effective. There's much of the world has huge amount of water in the atmosphere, even if you don't see it. A humid day, a hot, humid day, you might not see a cloud, but you might have 90% humidity. If you look at places like the Gulf states around the uh, Sea of Arabia, um, shallow sea, you might have... Um, um, you know, 40 degrees centigrade land masses. You've got uh, anything up to 95% humidity, which makes it kind of unbearable places to be. But then 95% humidity doesn't form clouds. But imagine if you could extract some of that humidity. There's a massive amount of water or the fogs on the California coast, massive amount of, that's almost 100% humidity. So can you extract humidity? Well, nature does extract humidity. It's called rain, right? How does rain happen? Actually, through whirlpools. The atmosphere is full of whirlpools. And whirlpools, caused by wind or whatever is happening, the temperature differentials, accelerate the air, which depressurizes it and cools it. And when that happens enough, we get rain, we get precipitation. So what I've done is designed a system to do that. And the early results are really interesting, really encouraging. And out of a cubic kilometer of atmosphere um, at just 70% humidity, which we get in the southwest of Australia most of the time, right? We're averaging around 68, 70%. A cubic kilometer of air is something like 27,000 cubic meters of water. Right. So people say, well, don't you affect the, uh, the atmosphere if you're doing that? And, and the point is that there is so much atmosphere. And when it rains, it's doing it all the time anyway. Right. So, and, and the numbers when we model this, taking um, you know, if you take 20% of that humidity out of a cubic kilometer, you're getting a huge amount of water, you're not affecting the atmosphere at all. It's making no difference, right? Because the surrounding atmosphere replaces it. And the drier the air gets, the greater the evaporation effect on the ocean. So it's a repeating cycle. So you're using biomimicry to get water. So that, that's the big one I'm on to right now. And uh, if we can succeed at that, if we, I know it works. It's just a matter of how much energy does it take to get a, a cubic meter of water. We're working on that. And I think it's going to be very viable. Wow. So uh, that could be pretty cool. 
Stay tuned, folks. <laughs> uh, um, Jay, what, what an absolute pleasure it's been. Um, I, again, I'm just so grateful um, for your wisdom and, and for your support over the years. And um, is there any closing words that you want to uh, put out there? If not, we'll um, we'll wrap it up, mate. Oh, I'm, I'm really good. Thank you so much, David. And, uh, and I must say I'm inspired by the work that you do and uh, I've seen what you've done with your property, which is a huge amount of work and uh, it's thriving. You can tell when I drive onto your property, it's alive. You know, it's happy you're there. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, much love, Jay. Oh, 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 oh,